Welcome to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. In series three, we'll be talking about healthcare from a global perspective, offering deep discussions about what it will take for a system shift that will benefit patients and healthcare professionals when medicine is practiced from the heart. We'll be hearing from Stephanie Mo Davis, Drs. Ruby Shah, Dan Dinenberg, and Diane Bonhoeffer as they share insights and wisdom from their personal experiences. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, welcome everybody to this uh, third episode of our third season of the Heart of Healthcare podcast. And to me again today are Stephanie and Ruby and Dan, and we have introduced everybody in our last sessions, and we will continue our deep dive into exploring uncharted ground, into questioning assumptions, and to see can we turn the dial a little bit on the um, on the question of healthcare possibilities. <laughs> Is there a way to turn from a sick care system to a healthcare system? And what is in the way? Where are we in the way? How do we interact with each other as healthcare professionals and patients? Where do we support each other? And where do we actually create major obstacles towards healing for each other? So here's a self-reflective group comprised of professionals, of patients, different kind of professional backgrounds. And, and we're exploring And today, the topic is about permission. It's about can we give ourselves permission for compassion? And that's a logical kind of step (laughs) after our previous conversation about suffering. So we we took a, a very close look at suffering and the different aspects and elements of this. And one of the questions that we touched on was that if we're really saying yes to suffering, then it means that there is somebody saying yes to suffering. And so we actually get to see a part of ourselves in a light that we haven't seen before and that we may not like. And so it's very easy to to jump over <clears throat> um, the fact that we're suffering right now. And we could very easily stay. And I'm normal. I'm healthy. I'm fine. Thank you. Temporarily, I'm just suffering, but it will all be fine. And actually, this piece, I don't need to look at very closely <clears throat> because I go from health to health. And in the meantime, there's a bit of inconvenience. And luckily, we have the doctors and the nurses and they go, they will sort it out. And the other way around, so or similarly so from the healthcare professional's perspective. Mm. As a healthy person, we'll help the transition and it's going to be fine. Mm. Um, now, that's not always the case, as we know. <clears throat> and today we want to explore what's in the way to accept the suffering. What's in the way to give ourselves permission to be with the suffering in a compassionate way? Mm. Is it easy? Is it difficult? Have we learned to do so? Are we invited to do so? Is this part of the healing process that we expect when we enter healthcare at either side of the desk or the bedside? So this is the territory we're exploring today. So welcome, Ruby and Stephanie and Dan. Let's dive into the conversation. Who wants to pick it up? I know we had different conversations already today, different combinations. Who wants to start off? I think um, one thing that was nice to hear you um, go over our last conversation about um, suffering. I heard it echoed in your words it put so beautifully. I couldn't help but but nod emphatically when you talk about what's in our way um, and the places where we might be stuck. We being um, the traditional medical model, the healthcare um, structure, um, and the way we approach suffering is um, is is as separate as occurring to some somebody outside of us, um, but also as as we talked last time about this warrior mentality against it. Um, so um, I think that that's a um, that although last time I think we did a great job of saying although it can be applauded. And we do certain things very, very well. We've got great medications to alleviate physical suffering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, That I I think this is one of the the places to start for me um, to to begin to realize that, oh, wait, um, (laughs) I'll I'll go ahead and say it. I should never hesitate. Um, Uh Oh, wait, am am I suffering? Because, again, for the for the clinician, every day you're faced with people who are suffering. So much, I'm, I'm doing air quotes, <laughs> so much suffering, so much more than you, that there's a, there's a distance. And it's in that distance that, um, that I've spent a lot of reflection time in the past couple of years, um, since I've been working with Stephanie, um, because 
um, I, I, I was always quick to recognize what I had in common with patients, but there was still continued to be this distance. You're the experiencer. I am here to fix you, <laughs> to observe you, to make, um, you know, um, certain interventions, but I'm not necessarily experiencing with you or bringing any of my own experience of suffering to the table. What, why would I? Cause that's not something that's valuable. Um, um, so, so to me, I think it's that distance between um, realizing who does the suffering in the hospital <laughs> or the clinic um, <laughs> that um, that we should start. Who does the suffering, Stephanie? Who does the suffering in the hospital? Mm-hmm. Uh, from a patient perspective, I would say that because I've been through such a multitude of traumatic physical events, that I have learned coming through this arduous at times process that I suffer, but I also simultaneously have an opportunity to have a broader perspective about my experience. And because I was hit so suddenly with so many serious physical ailments, I didn't have time to give myself permission. It was either you are going to take care of yourself right now and make some necessary adjustments within your life, not just your physical life, but how you're thinking, your emotional life, your spiritual life, you're going to get right real quick, or this is going to become harder than maybe it needs to be. So very early on, I realized the fight that I was trying to pursue with that egoic identity of, well, am I, I'm not useful like this. I can't clean my house like this. Uh, I'm only causing other people suffering by having them help me so often. I was constantly fighting with that lack-based mentality that somehow or something about my circumstance wasn't perfect as it is. But when I would surrender and relax into that pain, I would have this softening within my heart where I realized there's nothing I can do about this particular circumstance right now. I can do one of two things. I can fight against it, which literally doesn't make me feel any better. Or I can somehow admit that there may be something going on that's beyond my comprehension for some particular reason. And maybe this is an experience for me to reflect upon my life in a different way and maybe uh, use the time space space in the hospital bed that I've spent so long to determine who really am I and what do I really want with my life if I'm able to get myself out of this situation. So I was able to hold this dual perspective of recognizing when I fought against the suffering, which usually stemmed from lack-based beliefs about what other people would think of me. If I just let that go, it actually opened room for a beautiful opportunity of a broader perception that could actually benefit me through my most physical, the deepest physical challenges I had. I hear from you, uh, Dan, you want to pick it up? Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I just, you brought up some things and Ruby, this is a really, I love the flow of this conversation because what you just touched on Stephanie to me is, is for me as a physician, that idea of beyond comprehension, Mm -hmm. beyond knowing what it is, it just, it brings me back to our training and sort of how Ruby described the distance. I think the distance from the physician perspective comes from that we do know that we do have the diagnosis and the treatment and within ourselves, we have the answers and it's on our shoulders in order to do that. And so the very nature of what we're talking about, that creates this egoic self, this self-righteous self, this needing to know the answers. And so there's not much room for the compassion and the permission that we're talking about. So how I think of compassion is really the capacity to attend to the experience of others. Mm. And if you really think about it in that terms, it's that capacity to attend to the experience of others. What does that require of ourselves? And this is exactly how Ruby started with his like kind of going back to what we're talking about. It's not the antithesis. It's not the war. It's not the us versus them, if you're going to do that, then the distance is gone. Then you have to bring your presence and kindness 
maybe even your tenderness, definitely your curiosity, your vulnerability into the work. And that requires a whole different paradigm of how we have to grow both as the patient and as the quote unquote provider, right? Within that setting. And so compassion and the permission for compassion becomes the basis for caring. It's the willingness to see the beauty in others, what they're going through. But the mirror of that is ultimately that we can see that in ourselves. And when that flow of energy comes from ourselves to the patients, then we're in a whole different compassionate connection. And it is what is then possible is healing. And we kind of touched on that before. It's like the curing versus the healing. It's the fight versus the harmonious connection. And that's what we have the opportunity to kind of talk through right now. It feels to me like we discussed earlier that potential for the love and the wisdom to be operating simultaneously towards a greater goal, which is the healing. So if Mm -hmm. we have the wisdom that's being held, that space, by the practitioner, but also that space to honor the subjective experience of the patient without necessarily trying to tell them how to feel or think about it. Really let the experience flow through them organically and without your own judgment, being a clear vessel of understanding, I know my role as the doctor here, but I also want to really check out of their subjective experience so they can get as much as they need from realizing what's trying to come through at this very difficult time. Mm -hmm. So we have two roles here. One is you're describing this, Stephanie, as an egoic entity that is fighting signs and symptoms, is fighting an illness or condition. And on the other hand, we have an egoic entity that is burdened with, that is mandated (laughs) to change the situation. (laughs) And so maybe we can look at kind of who is experiencing on both sides and of who is, what is that part that is experiencing the pain and the suffering? And on the other hand, what is the, that wants to fight it? And what is that part that is resonating in the physician that is kind of ready to fight the war against cancer, you know, or whatever it is that is, that is canvassed all this very combative language in healthcare. Um, What is it that resonates? What are the parts that actually resonate? And what might be another couple, so to speak? What might be another part in the patient? And what might be another part in the physician that could also team up? So one part is sort of the the, the team of fighters. And is there also another part? And what does it take for us as a patient to recognize that other part? And what does it take for us as a physician to recognize that other part? And how can we help these two line up? I'm just loving this space right now. Mm-hmm. I feel like the the um, we can ask a patient <laughs> to speak about because um, we've talked a lot about the the potential um, in the suffering, the pain, um, and the the gift and the learning of it. And um, Dan, you've put beautiful words around um, receiving back and understanding. You know this this cyclic nature of um, of the true experience. Um, I don't have words for the the two aspects, but I do, do I do I do think that once we're in this these these higher different aspects, um, future aspects that we're trying to manifest, um, they they do have they see each other um, differently. Um, maybe they maybe we we're not necessarily recognizing all of of um, all of the aspects that our patients can um, embody. I don't know if any of that made sense, but I think. I ended up eventually saying what I'm trying to say. So when what I hear from you is that you're saying, yes, there's more than one person. It looks like when we're suffering, when I am suffering, it looks like me, myself, and I, one person, not three of us, right? (laughs) So um, I guess everybody who has been suffering profoundly, anybody who had some moment of profound suffering will know that at that point, there are moments where there is truly like nothing there. There's nobody there. There's emptiness. There's loneliness. There's 
a nothingness, a, a void sort of sense that can be very overwhelming. Yes. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> with the benefit of hindsight, so if you like, at the end of this tunnel, we realized that we were not alone. And that's kind of the first often unconscious experience that, oh, there's one part of me that has actually carried me through all of this. There was something that had either hope or vision or purpose or something, but there was something that kind of saw that was aware of the void. Mm -hmm. And that which was aware of the void, I, quote, (laughs) didn't pay attention to because I felt like nothing but the void. Mm -hmm. And yet throughout the process, there was an awareness of it. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, this this awareness and maybe other aspects of this, aspects of me, quote, <laughs> um, actually also come into play where I where one part of me has the the experience of not being alone. So there's one part of me that is suffering and has pain, is experiencing pain, and another part actually is strong and is kind of taking this other part by its hand and says, come on, we can do this together. You will make it. Whatever their role distribution is at any given second, (laughs) but they're both available to different degrees. So there's one part that is fighting and there's one part that is accepting and learning and giving permission to feel the suffering and give them permission to attend, as as Dan said, to attend to the suffering. What is that other part in the physician? So what is the what is the the vis-a-vis? What is the counterpart to this in the physician? <laughs> if if I feel like I'm answering you a lot, Jan, but I, if I can be a little um, uh, bring in an, a, maybe an archetype because the the one that comes to mind um, is almost sort of versus the warrior. If we're talking about the the the, the old paradigm doctor is this warrior. Um, the new paradigm doctor has more of the sage within them where they have this vision, this, 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 a good distance of being able to, to far see, but still be present and attend to the compassion, the heart, the love and the wisdom, as Stephanie put it. Um, so just, I, I know it's always been very helpful to me sometimes to have these these archetypes, you know, to, to, to start to understand the difference between what, what I'm seeing in the world or within myself and what maybe I can aspire to. Um, so this archetype of the sage versus the warrior, perhaps there's something there we can talk about. Dan, it looks like you're. Yeah. I, without having the answer, but I'm just going to talk through sort of the feeling because yeah, I really love the idea of the love and wisdom, but at some level there's something in me, which is the intuitive knowing. And so (laughs) it's just the connecting on that level. But then there's another part of me that maybe we can name and -hmm. we can figure out what this other thing is, which is, look, I know that increasing compassion actually improves patient safety. You know, better communication is fewer mistakes. I'm sure it increases patient satisfaction. It increases morale and retention. All these things that maybe on a day-to-day I'm not thinking about or worrying about, but there's a part of me as the physician that has to be, look, there's the other side of this. Like, I mean, I can definitely think that, you know, my patients that I was connecting with on this thing. Do you think there's a same medical legal litigation standpoint? No, you're connecting with a person as a human being. There's going to be less of that. And so you're saving time. You have better medical outcomes. And just from a physiologic standpoint, you know, when you're compassionate and you're connecting in that way with someone, you're increasing oxytocin, you're, you're decreasing stress reaction, you're moderating depression, anxiety. So all of these metrics, measurements that I know are happening as well, because I see it and experience it. And so there's love and wisdom, but then there's also sort of like, if I have a part of me that is whatever that egoic self that still likes to be a top physician doing all the right things and doing that, whatever that name thing, it's still happening. And so when I see both on the intuitive, the inner knowing level and the outcome level, that's sort of the integration that really is necessary to be like, oh yeah, 
this is next level medicine. This is where we need to be going because it's actually both and it's yeah. doing that. But maybe we can name that as a group. What is that need for metrics, need for showing the world what we're doing that is actually bettering medicine? So when you say bettering medicine, I guess we could say that bettering medicine has the aspect of improving signs and symptoms. And that can go to what we call the causal root of the signs and symptoms. So you have a pneumonia over, you know, 150, 200 years, we figure out that, oh, there's bugs down there. Huh, if we kill those bugs, that actually helps in overcoming pneumonia. Right. Or we you have a cancer and over 200 years, we're gradually figuring out, oh, there's genes and then oh, they encode for some proteins. And, oh, this is where the cellular regulation goes funny. And maybe we can tweak that process. So a very, if you like, materialistic view, very uh, a world that is described as an objective experience. <laughs> um, and then there is the other aspect of medicine that is the subjective experience of both the patient and the healthcare professional. And we tend to say, oh yeah, that's up to the shrinks, right? So that's that's the psychiatrist's job, right? That's send them to the psychologist. That's about how they feel, right? That's not my job here. <clears throat> and it's probably in this isolation where we're a lot gets lost, where we are, where we're missing the wholeness, where we're missing the completeness, where we're missing to see the connections. And of course, there's, you know, great fields where metrics are being established. You know? um, immunopsychology, right? um, psychosomatic illnesses, right? So there are areas of, of, of medical exploration that are, that are exploring what can be measured in the interconnection between the subjective and the objective experience. Mm -hmm. I think if I could could speak on that from the patient point of view is that through 10 to 12 years of severe illness, multiple times on dialysis, multiple organ transplants in and out of the hospital a hundred times a near death experience. I can say that coming through that and spending a lot of time in self-reflection and self-examination, I realized that the medical field as it stands was very good at healing 50% of my problem. I still fully stand by the knowingness that if I wouldn't have committed and had an opening to the inner work that was completely interconnected with my physical experience, I do not think I would be here and I definitely would not be thriving and as energetic as I am. Somehow having these two aspects be decoupled from each other, that's where I believe that we're losing a lot um, uh, of this deeper understanding that we are a, we are a mind, a body, and a spirit complex. And if we don't realize and we can't see, maybe, for instance, the upstream effects that have been occurring on a biologic level, emotional level, uh, psyche level, that have maybe weakened our state to the point of maybe... Uh, creating this space for the disease process to come forth. And I know this may sound, you know, slightly woo woo, but this is a very real lived experience. And what I've learned for myself is that we need to understand the aspects of how the emotions and the mind are possibly have contributed to manifestations and how we can realize that that is such a powerful component of health and wellness of the physical body is to address the whole body. And we, and addressing the mind is not really addressing the soul or the spirit and some of the deepest aspects of us that are within our nature that maybe only reveal before death, if we can reveal and appreciate this essence from the get-go, the entirety of the experience would be different for the patient. For instance, if you were to see a patient in office and they're just diagnosed with cancer and they're devastated, for the physician to be able to hold that dual perspective of physician and sage and say, look, there's going to be a very tangible three-dimensional process we're going to go through that's going to be challenging, but I'm going to be here with you. But I also want you to reflect on how this can be an opportunity for you from an emotional and a psychological and a soulful level as well, too, because we've discovered the patients who are doing this sort of self-reflection rather than just being in an anxious state of 
unknowingness of what's going to happen and treating the anxiety and the depression that come along with the physical illness. If we offered the patient another way, I know what it's like to be on dialysis and to sit in a chair for four hours every other day, getting your blood filtered. Most of those patients have to be sedated to just get through the experience without anxiousness. If we instead had an alternative way and said, this is our opportunity. If you have the energy to self-reflect, how can we do this deeper work and start to focus on the soul and these other aspects of ourself that's not always valued in medicine that may actually give you something more positive or reflective to think about rather than the unknown, which is culminating more stress and anxiety yeah. and treatment of those sorts of conditions. Yeah. Well, as a classically trained uh, physician, I would say I'd love to be able to do that, but I'm completely <laughs> incompetent. Like I have n neither do I have, all I can bring to the table is having a tiny little human experience on this planet. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can bring to the table with, you know, heart, so far, luckily not being, you know, receiving multiple organ transplants and hemodialysis and all of that, but so far being more or less healthy. Mm -hmm. And what I can bring to the table is what I read in the books and the experience I've gained in the meantime by seeing many patients. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have not learned to even be aware of a dimension of spiritual healing. I have, I'm not aware of the dimension of, of self-reflection as part of a healing process. I don't give myself the permission. And how could I hold the space for a patient or even, God forbid, when actually something happens as part of this process <laughs> and the patient actually, you know, uh, experiences altered states, um, what I'm going to do? Yeah, I will be quite helpless. And when I turn to my um, uh, colleagues in psychiatry, many of them will also feel helpless and diagnose some syndrome and find some medication, right? Mm -hmm. So to actually being able to go there is, is interesting. And in our conversation, we, we said we, we are aware of the, the part in the patient that is suffering, and we have identified the part in the patient that is actually holding the space and that is available to see and be with the one that is suffering. We have struggled with identifying the accompanying partner uh, in the physician so far. And I, I think that's why. Right? Mm -hmm. it's because you got it's, it. it's actually yeah. a blind spot. It's it. not yeah. trained and, and it's not only not trained, it's actually discouraged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As here, subjective here and experience, right? Yeah, this might this might be part of the resolution is right. the subjective experience. Yeah. So so for for um for us um in our work, um we what Stephanie represents is not just a patient who's currently experiencing, but she's been through her experience and able to self-reflect and has become an expert in integrating, processing and integrating that experience. So now bringing back that person who's been through that experience into the team is one possibility that we often talk about. How about having Stephanie's on teams, bringing in the patients who've been through it? A, a very, very uh -huh. different, but similar to the support group process. But this is now bringing it into the team, embedding the wisdom onto the team, the experience that's been through and holding space for that patient would be an answer. And and, and we also believe if you have that, 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 the power of somebody who's doing that and helping others to do that, that might help the doctors to start to go through that self-reflection process us and maybe we can level up because man we need it we need it we're pushing the the limit here again that's that's really wonderful um i am conscious of time and we only have a few minutes left for this conversation here so um i think we've we've identified a number of really important kind of cornerstones that we'll highlight in the in the in the show notes and um we want to continue with this conversation. So we want to move forward and, and actually move from suffering where we're coming from to giving ourselves permission and asking the question, who is actually giving permission and who do we need to ask for permission here? So we, we've established there's actually at least four, four involved in this healing process rather than two, as it seemed. So before we started <laughs> and, and so, and in the next conversation, we want to look at meaning and potential and purpose. I think this will actually help us possibly to encourage this fourth player <laughs> to come forth. <laughs> 
to see what is the meaning and what is the purpose that this fourth player <laughs> may may have and how does it change our our interaction and how does it change our potential to to move deeper into healing and a little bit beyond the signs and symptoms mm. so we'll have to close for today <laughs> um but this has been really exciting i think we've made another wonderful step any any final comments from from any one of you thank you this was great <laughs> Mm-hmm. I'm just so excited. I really, it's pushing us beyond what it was a motif of kind of the wounded healer. That was the one physician that might understand because they've been through it themselves to understanding now with Stephanie and those that have been on the team to share that wisdom so we can elevate and not need to be in our own suffering because suffering exists for all. And we can all elevate to that level and grow into a new paradigm of, of medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm. But if I could just close by saying, Jan, Dan, and Ruby, coming from a patient's perspective, you do enough. You do enough. I'm not sitting here as the patient expecting you to hold this position that I have presented today. It's taken me a lifetime of very severe uh, experiences to attain what I'm speaking. So please, I don't want you to think that you all of a sudden have to learn how to be enlightened and become a sage. And that's a lifetime of study. I love what you guys do. You're amazing. Don't change. If you change, that's great. But I think having other people who can connect with us might fill that missing piece a little more eloquently. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining today. Talk to you very soon again. Have a good week. Thanks for listening to this Heart of Healthcare podcast brought to you by Heart-Based Medicine. If you enjoyed the conversation, you'll find some free resources and more information at heartbasedmedicine.org. Please share this episode if you feel inclined and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, thanks and take care.